introduce her with you. Uh, please let me share. Okay, uh, and this is Dr. Else Kohular Rolefson. Uh, she is a project direct coordinator of League for Pastoral Peoples and Indigenous Livestock Development Germany and co-director co of Marwar Camel Culture Festival, Rajasthan, India. She is a veterinarian and as well as a, an archeologist. Uh, she completed her doctorate on camel domestication. She's basically a writer, activist, fundraiser, teacher, and trainer uh, with a diversified knowledge. And uh, she works towards the policies and practices that support socially responsible and ecologically sustainable livestock development. Uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Ilse Kohla Rolefson. Please uh, share your screen and provide your valuable lecture. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, we can okay. hear you. Okay, great. Okay, super. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me and and for putting together this amazing summer school. I I I just can't believe the logistic uh, challenges this entails. So, uh, and I'm joining from uh, Rajasthan, India, from the rural areas, and the sometimes most of the time the internet is pretty good, but. Um, if it's not, uh, you just have to bear with me. So the subject I was given is transhumans, a way of life, uh, truly sustainable. And this picture you see here, it was uh, taken not very far, just a few kilometers from where I live. And it shows a group of Raika shepherds uh, on migration the last day before they're reaching their home village. So the subject I was given is transhumans, but trans and pastoralism is a way of using land and raising animals that is actually ubiquitous all over the world, but it is often invisible people just don't know, are not aware of their existence. And my organization, the League for Pastoral Peoples, we recently started a mapping project. And uh, we have already mapped about uh, 600 different uh, pastoral groups around the world. So you can go to this website if you would like to know uh, more about it. So pastoralism is actually, you find it on the rangelands of the world, which take up about 66% of the world's agricultural land. I mean, just, um, this is just a really truly amazing that on only on about 30% of the agricultural land, you can grow crops. The rest can only be used uh, via uh, livestock, via herding, via pastoralism. India is, yeah, ex excuse me for uh, bringing in a lot of pictures from India. It's just because uh, I, that's the situation I know best. So India is actually, you know, it's always perceived as a land of farmers, but in reality, it's a collage of pastoralist culture. Most of them are agro-pastoralists which are integrated with crop cultivation one way or another, but you find them all over India. And they actually also produce the majority of its livestock products. The pastures of India produce more than 70% of its meat and around 60% of its milk. So it's, it's truly amazing the economic contribution that the pastures of India make, especially considering that India is also the largest exporter of sheep and goat in the world. And it's also the largest exporter of uh, Also the largest dairy producers and you know the majority of that produce actually comes from pastoralist systems ma'am can i interrupt uh one moment uh, please uh, go to the uh, ah to the uh, okay uh, slide uh, the uh, 
bildschirm präsentation Please go to the just, just press f5 press f5 okay press f5 uh -huh. function key f5 just f5 or or something else or, or you just go on the bottom of this slide bottom no. just can I, can't I just go from here from the oh no sorry. Uh, yes 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 you can do from there as well no no i'm gonna go from here up there there now yeah click yeah okay so transhumans is a subset of pastoralism and it's derived from those two words from trans for across and humus from earth and so it in Tales the seasonal movement of people and herds between summer and winter pastures at usually at different altitudes. So animals and herds move from lowlands in the winter to the highlands in the summer. And it's a like it's a, on a they go on a set route and they always have uh, basically the same winter and the same summer pastures. So so that is the difference uh, to pastoralism in general, where uh, the movements are much more flexible. Transhumance also occurs actually uh, in not mountainous areas in flatlands and these Raika pastorals from Rajasthan here, they, they have one place where they stay during the monsoon in the, um, in the rainy season. And then the other nine months of the year, they are moving around in uh, agricultural areas and, and using the sheep to uh, convert uh, byproducts into into products uh, and if we go back here um, uh, to this map of india what you see on the top here jammu and kashmir uh, those are transhuman pastoralists the bakaval changpa gadi guja uh, the in himachal pradesh again you have the gadi which are shepherds the gujars which have uh, buffaloes and uh, the bakaval are people who, who uh, raise goats so uh, Northern India is uh, full of transhumans. Um, so transhumans involves multi-species coexistence of human and non-human animals, which can be sheep, goats, buffaloes, cattle, horses, camels, yaks, yamas, and alpacas, and often together with transport animals and guard dogs. And so this this group of you know of people and of their animals they kind of they form one social structure one organism they work together as a team they usually they have an elected leader and but everybody has a role so it's a very complex social system in which all duties are shared this picture again it's from Rajasthan uh, taken just a few months ago uh, of these people on their way home. Why do people go on transhumans? It has, for them, mostly economic reasons because in transhuman systems, the animals are more productive. They give more milk and they have higher fertility. The intervals between the births of the animals are less in transhuman hairs than in sedentary herds. It also means you can have a higher number of animals than if you keep, keep them year round in the same place in a sedentary system. It also entails low production costs. You don't have to spend any money on feeding your animals. Fourthly, the products of animals that walk and exercise are healthier and tastier than those uh, raised in intensive system. And one important point is also that it's not the people who take the animals on migration, but it's the animals themselves, the herds, at a certain time of the year, they become impatient, they want to move. And it's very difficult to actually to herd them back to that place where you're staying. They want to move on uh, to the next place, you kind of feel it so that, you know, it's time to move. So, so it's, you know, it's a system, transhumans is a system which is, powered both by you know by people's intelligence and by animal intelligence and i find animal intelligence may be much more important than artificial intelligence uh, for coping with the future and i'll give you one example here uh, from spain you'll probably hear more about it from uh, another speaker in this session francesca but i will 
was lucky to visit there recently, and it's the country with the best documented system of transhumans. And this is a very old system that goes back uh, four or 500 years ago, and it had royal patronage, and it was set up basically to support the breeding of the Merino sheep, which at that time produced very fine wool, and Spain had a monopoly on, on that wool and on the Merino sheep. And it was actually, that wool was the source of the richness of Spain at the time. It enabled um, Spain to finance Columbus to, you know, to find India, etc. And so it was for them very important to keep the sheep moving because it was, the, it was better for the sheep. So this system actually, uh, you know, these, it consisted of the so-called cañadas, and uh, which are wide, very wide pathways for sheep. They were like uh, up to 70 meters wide and they cover about 1% of Spain's surface. And they are 124,000 kilometers long or eight, nine times the length of Spain's current railway system. So these systems, they fell into disuse in the earliest 20th century when it became possible to transport the flocks by train. Uh, and that had all kinds of ecological consequences. So basically it was recognized, I'll expand on that a little bit later, that this transhumance is really important for the ecology and wildlife of Spain. And in 1995, Spain passed new legislation to protect the network. And uh, you have this photo here, and this is a, a, a drinking place for the troll for the sheep on, and in the background you see between the forest there, that's actually a cañada. So these are very wide roads. Um, then in India, we, of course, the Himalayas, you know, I mean, it looks like nothing is growing there, but actually, you know, these sheep, this is a Gadi shepherd, he's taking his sheep up into the alpine pasture where there's very um, nutritious and healthy grass for the, for the sheep and for the goats uh, to, to, to eat. And which really, and it's uh, the, the minerals in, in that forage that keeps the, the animals healthy and, and uh, also provide, produces really good uh, products. Um, we also have transhumans in um, Western Africa and actually the majority of the Sahel's cattle uh, and a large proportion of its sheep and goats are kept in this uh, transhuman uh, system. And it's basically the only way of, of utilizing that uh, arid area. And again here, uh, these transhuman systems supply uh, about 65% of cattle meat and 40% of mutton and goat meat and 70% of milk. I mean, it's, it's, it's truly amazing the, the output of these uh, transhuman systems. Um, transhumans has a lot of ecological benefits and actually from what I have heard, the, the transhuman roots often follow the ancient roots of the wild herd animals. And they connect ecosystems for genetic uh, exchange. So um, Spain, for instance, has like several, uh, you know, uh, different uh, biological uh, areas and it's uh, the, the sheep and the, the goats who move and they, they bring uh, new uh, genetic resources from one place to the other and they, they transform, transport seeds and insects and other small animals in their wool. And especially that uh, carrying the seeds seems to be of uh, major um, importance in times of climate change because it enables plants to, uh, you know, to move to, to adapt and to move to new um, ecosystems. And there, there are also calculations on the value, uh, on the, co you know, if you transform this in com into commercial value, the seed exchange, there are some really big figures come out. And we must also remember that many of our most beloved landscapes were actually created by pastoralists. On the left, we can see the, uh, this is the Spanish Dehesa, which is a silvi agro-pastoral system in which uh, pigs and sheep and goat and also cattle are kept. And the, the, the pigs, for instance, they eat these, uh, the, the acorns of these um, oak trees. 
or in Germany on the right, you have, this is the Lüneburg Keys. It's also a very famous holiday area and it's been created by, uh, by sheep grazing. And there are many, uh, you know, many of the most natural, what we think are natural landscapes like the Tibetan plateau, they've actually been shaped by uh, pastoralists and their grazing animals over the thousands of years. One really important aspect also of uh, which transhumans and pastoralism ensures is that there is manure in the landscape and the manure is actually at the bottom of the food chain because it, uh, you know, it's a haven for insects and the insects then get um, eaten by birds and so on. It's at the bottom of the, of the food chain. So having herbivores grazing animals in the landscape is incredibly important for um, biological diversity. A uh, similar situation is in, uh, in Africa also, where uh, pastoralism has existed since uh, several thousands of years. And actually where people had their temporary settlements, their bomas, uh, because the dung gets this, uh, accumulates there, then this creates really hot spots of biodiversity uh, in the long run. So we have here a situation where humans don't buy biodiversity, but they are actually um, supporting it. They're creating it. Pastoralism or grazing is also the only way of maintaining biodiversity rich meadows. Studies have been done which show that if you mow grassland, you actually kill an enormous percentage of uh, cicadas and of, of, of other uh, animals. So grazing is really the only way of maintaining biodiversity in the world's uh, grasslands. Um, so, so this is one of the reasons why uh, at the moment of uh, bringing back biodiversity and the pioneer in this Jane who's actually he's a he's a, a naturalist a, um, a wildlife person and he was in charge of um, taking care of uh, several national parks in Spain and he realized the uh, the importance of of uh, sheep for maintaining it and he also realized that because when sheep were started to being transported by by a train then they stayed long, they they were at the there wasn't that time for migrating anymore so they arrived at the wrong places at the wrong time and actually uh, started uh, you know, killing uh, 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 trees that, that were just emerging. They, uh, they were eating it at the wrong time of the, uh, of the year. So, um, because they were not on migration anymore. So he's put a lot of effort into bringing back uh, the, the transhumans. And he started an organization called uh, Consejo de la Mesta, which is again, the Mesta was the, the earlier sheep uh, herding organization which created the Merino sheep, et cetera. It's, a, it's also a very, you know, an old organization, an old system of managing uh, Spanish sheep and Spanish, um, uh, Spanish sheep production and managing the land. And he's also bringing back the, the whole, trying to bring back the whole culture around uh, shepherding, now, which also includes uh, bell weathers, for instance. These are castrated, uh, male sheep or and goats which act as leaders of the herd and which the whole flock follows and uh, these uh, they have a very close relationship to people and and listen to them and they are trained to lead the the herd and this is a characteristic of um shepherding systems uh, in the mediterranean area who keep away the uh, predators which are a lot there are wolves and so on in, in in these areas so there's whole culture around the the transhumans um and it's not just in spain where it's being revived also uh, 
here, since we're, <laughs> it's the Ukraine uh, summer school here, I, I found this example also in the, in the Carpathians, there are efforts to, to revive the transhumans. And in 2013, a shepherd did a really long uh, trip uh, through starting in the Czech Republic and then going to Slovakia and, and to Romania. So, uh, and then, in 2019, the transhumans was actually recognized as intangible cultural heritage of humanity at the application of, of three countries, um, Austria, Greece, and which one is the other one? Another country. And there is now an, an effort to really, you know, to revive it across Europe. And you, you'll probably hear more about that in, in other lectures by Francesca later on, because it's from her I learned all about this. Also people like this professor from Nevada, who projects transhumans as antidote for modern sedentary stock raising. And I think that there is a lot to that. I mean, in these days and age, um, there is such a big anti-livestock lobby for, and it, it is there for a reason because the industrial systems are um, bad for the animals, bad for the environment, bad for food quality, bad, I mean, from almost all perspectives, except for using cheap uh, products. So transhumans is actually, yes, it's the alternative model, which we really need to bring back uh, in, in the future, I think, because it, it has only positive uh, um, impact. I mean, it doesn't have any, I, I just can't find anything negative about it. The only thing is, it, it, of course, it does not produce as much as industrial uh, livestock keeping. It does, um, but it, it has the one big advantage. Uh, it's an, a way of making use of variability, whereas, you know, normal, I mean, the modern livestock keeping, it's all about creating uh, standardized conditions, uniform conditions, uh, the animals, you know, that it's exactly, uh, they need to be kept under certain standardized conditions and they need standardized feed and they get mature in a standard number of days. And if they don't get slaughtered at that uh, stage, then there is a huge problem because they don't fit the, the, the abattoirs. So, whereas, Pastoralism is a way, you know, it goes with the flow. It's a way of using, um, making variability work as my friend and colleague Saverio Kretli always says. It's a way of, and so it prepares us ideally for um, coping with climate change. Um, it also keeps the groundwater clean and integrates with wildlife. That's a nice thing. I mean, it's it's not about wildlife, you know, uh, human wildlife or uh, domestic animal wildlife conflict. They can actually coexist in many coexist. And where I live here, uh, there are a lot of leopards. They eat uh, some of the the sheep and goats, but the rika they accept that. They say, I mean, the, the leopard also uh, needs to live. So, so the most pastors have actually a, a very positive outlook on, on wildlife. And uh, what I like best about it is the fact that it's animal welfare friendly and the animals in pastoral systems actually have longer lifespans than in the wild and in industrial systems. So it's a, it's a way of taking care of and, and that's really the attractive thing about it. So, um, so yes, so that's my presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, another picture here from my uh, neighboring area of these pastoralists uh, whom I'm very fascinated by. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, you are in very timely uh, presented your uh, uh, lecture. Uh, you really said that the India is a land of farmer, actually, and you already discussed about many things um, elaborately. The seasonal movement uh, about the ecological benefits of transhumans and how the pastoralism maintained by diversity, uh, the transhumans uh, revival, and you have uh, presented the pictorial examples from different countries uh, like Spain, India, Himalayas. Um, 
west africa and in the pictorial presentation was very nice very wonderful thank you um, uh, for your very wonderful and informative presentation thank you now 